the humans feared creatures in the dark, angry spirits in the night. And when they looked to the looming serpent's spine, they feared an unending tide of savage monsters, the stuff of exiled dwarves' tales. The hobgoblin tribes who lived in the foothills were a pest and a nuisance, but merely that. They feared the wrong thing. That is obvious, as Grand Marshal Mogowon surveys the armies assembled before him in Sarilavhan. Off to one side lay the Ninyu Kikun, the High Marshal's elite. On the other, the slave state rabble of the Zanyu Kikun, standing before him straight in salute. The Wolf Marshal, the Lion Marshal, the Boar Marshal, their armies behind them. He holds their eyes for a second, then two, then three, before his gaze moves on, drawn to the massive banners of looted silk, each martial subordinate generals accompanied by a standard bearer. Beyond that, bodies seem to blur together, but the Grand Marshal knows what he would see, know the strict organization that governs every body in this vast plain. The Nosunin, led by the infantry's lieutenant general, consisting of eight regiments per army, four banners per regiment, eight bands per banner, and three teams per band, ten soldiers in a team, all of whom hope to one day rise and command one of these groupings themselves. On the flanks, the Gikunin cavalry, three war-riding tribes, the elite of their command, and given the massive wolves to train and ride. Some say the war lieutenants and crested riders who serve as subordinates here are nigh bestial themselves. But such voices are few and far between. Their charges tend not to leave survivors. This is the Hobgoblin army. This is the great command. This is what Hales, Halan will soon learn to fear. Beat the drums of war, hail the three-headed chimera, the time has arrived, it's time to paint Halan! The hobgoblins are a far cry from other beastly races. Their history of slavery in the jade mines have set them apart from the brutish orcs and the cowardly goblins. They have channeled the hatred for their human masters and the mages that kept them in check into a disciplined and regimented lifestyle. Every hobgoblin family is a military unit in itself that crafts its own weapons and whose children begin weapons training as early as 80 years old. After breaking their chains and slaughtering their masters, the hobgoblins spilled into northern Rachen from the mines with a fury that matched the great Tukans. And even if violence was necessary, they didn't surrender to rage and superstition like the orcs did. Instead of a bloodthirsty horde, the hobgoblin tribes organized into military commands, with hierarchies that were governed by merit, not by coin, raw power or some imagined divine right. Each command overseen by a marshal, and the most accomplished of them would also oversee the great command as a whole, as grand marshal. And by this statocratic rule, the hobgoblins not only freed themselves, but also shook Rahen to the core. In 1444, Grand Marshal Mogovon of the Wolf Command ruled the state. He was already an accomplished hero with amazing stats, a conqueror, an inspiring leader and a tactical genius. His exemplary leadership has led the most recent campaign in the Shamadani region of Sir and its surrounding countryside. At 48 years old, though, he was surprisingly old for a hobgoblin. A short life is the consequence of constant war and constant struggles. But Mogowon was extremely skilled, or perhaps lucky. The command did not wage war for pleasure nor for sport. War was necessary for survival. The humans cannot really make the difference between a hobgoblin, an orc, an oni, or a goblin. The humans classify them all as beasts that are to be used like cattle or like dogs. When they are not useful to them anymore, they are to be put down without a second thought. This is their definition of civilization, and that civilization is a threat. At the end of a campaign, 
the Grand Marshal summons the now traditional settlement of swords of the War Room. In the War Room, the three commands would each propose an objective and leave the Grand Marshal to decide which objective should take priority for the benefit of the larger state. The settlement of swords is special. In this case, the commands propose plans for further campaigns of conquest. The settlement is actually created by the marshals and the retinues by plunging their swords into the ground and forming a wall around the discussion grounds to show that they will not fight against each other. A ritual formality more than a genuine concern at this point in time. The Wolf Command proposed a plan to finish the conquest of Shamakad and strike the ruined kingdoms. The Boar Command argued that the mystics of the Shia Ken, left to their mysterious ways, will cause instability within the borders of the Hobgoblin state. Moguwon had a choice to make. The ancient kingdom of Rajnadaga was fairly strong, but diplomatically isolated at the edge of the Raj. Fighting them should be simple and straightforward, but risked panicking the smaller elephant duchies. The Xia were overall numerous and skilled in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but severely fragmented. A powerful blow to the south should crush them before they could unite into a more centralized state. Mogulwon prioritized the Boer Marshal's plan and ordered preparations for the Xia Dao campaign. Yet, the Great Command is not a horde. It is a very strict structure with very clear purpose. It cannot simply attack and conquer. A campaign must be endorsed by the loyalty of the three factions, and the factions are only loyal to legitimate rulers. Legitimacy can only be gained through works that benefit the state, development, infrastructure projects, and strategic victories. That is why new Grand Marshals, when appointed at the death of the previous one, must first prove themselves before conquests can continue. The three factions are the three heads of the Chimera, the Wolf Command is the faction expert in administration and logistics. They are the most cunning of the three, the planners, the strategists, and the administrators. They keep the great state running. The Boar Command is the fiercest, the state's sword and shield. The Boar Hobgoblins are the first to join an attack and the last to leave a defensive position. The Lion Command is the most charismatically gifted. Their officers lead by example and inspire the legions with their expert speeches. When others despair, the lion hobgoblins stand tall as the spirit of the state. Each is represented in game by a faction and an estate, and each has a plethora of unique privileges. Granting privileges is very lucrative, but favoritism hurts the legitimacy of the Grand Marshal. Each faction also has its own capital, represented by respective war camps the lion camp in the old dwarven capital of Gronstunad, the boars camp north of Shamakad in the highlands of Tam Vihar, and the wolves camp around the temple complex of Sarilavhan, the capital of the nation. Each of them also employs personal retinue of elite troops. The Ninyu Kikun guard their core fiercely and the commands do not appreciate them being used by the larger state. These are usually kept close to home, but can be offered special privileges, which do hurt the faction loyalty somewhat. The Kikunin armies can be raised in the field later, but their manpower is very low and they cost military power to maintain. Their main usefulness stems from their ability to settle non-hobgoblin lands and thus further pacify problematic provinces. Recent expansion did see the command rule over a massive population of non-hobgoblins. The human majority within the borders of the Great Command are represented by the Kerunanin estate, that translates to the conquered ones. They are mostly left to trade and live their petty lives in peace as long as they serve their betters. Rebelling humans and mage shamans are immediately executed, but if they prove honor and loyalty, they may aspire to be called Vuhyun, or honorable non-hobgoblins. What's good to know about these estates, from a mechanical perspective, is that each of the commands have a special commissions privilege, which simply grants them 10 loyalty upon adoption. They will be automatically removed after 5 years, so even if they do affect legitimacy slightly, they are very much worth using on cooldown. Where humans and harimari can be dealt with relatively easily, with orcs and goblins the situation is different. The goblin tribes, 
chaotic and disorganized, were allowed to serve the command from their holds in the Jade Mountains, providing minerals, serpent's bloom rations, and cannon fodder to the nation. The Black Step and the Stolen Gem are loyal to the command, but have a deep content for each other. They mindlessly sabotage and fight each other in the tunnels to the distraction and sometimes despair of the Grand Marshals who have to step in between them every time a new reason for conflict is found. On the long term, the Hobgoblins observe and hope to ease the tensions between the two goblin slave states at great diplomatic costs. The Zanyuki Kunin, or the Orcs, on the other hand, prefer life in the open air. They are just too simple-minded and brutish to be left to their own devices. They must be guided by their hobgoblin superiors. The orcish slave tribes of Thunderfist and Bloodsong in southern Shamakad are undisciplined and dishonorable, but can always be uprooted and moved to newly conquered states, alleviating overextension and the administrative burden of coring provinces. Resettling them also allows the orcs to quench their thirst for violence, making it easy to keep them pleased and subservient to the detriment of the Raheni that have to deal with their fury. Hobgoblins can rarely be seen outside their own borders in a non-warlike capacity. One place where they visit more and more lately is the capital of the Azjakuma Oni. Not to marvel at their grand temples or to seek their twisted guidance, but to acquire Korashi. This rare material is used to neutralize magical effects, where the command's state doctrine is to mutilate or execute any wielders of magic within its borders, using Korashi chains allows them to bind shamans, known as mages by other countries, and allow them to use their powers only as living weapons during battles. The Korashi supply is the only thing that keeps the Oni safe and with more lands conquered by the command, more Korashi is required to bind the increasing amounts of shamans. Mokuvon's internal responsibilities had him juggle with appeasing the estates, improving relations with the vassal slave states and the Oni while gathering manpower for the next campaign. On top of everything, the year 1447 saw open rebellion in Seir, the Hobgoblin regiments had to pause their drills and march into the city to pacify the rebels once and for all. Following this display of insubordination, the Great Command permanently disarmed the Gerunanin. No non-Hobgoblin would be allowed to produce or hold weapons on pain of death. Goblin infighting, as annoying as it was, did not manage to disrupt Serpent's Bloom ration deliveries for the campaigns to come. Between the two slave states in the Jade Mountains, Stolen Gem were assigned as the official stewards of the mines and were tasked to make sure that the influx of metals and precious stones would not be interrupted by their little feud with Black Step. The scouts returned with a clear picture of the terrain, rolling hills and verdant plains, perfect for marching through, with even seasons and familiar edible crops grown by the local populace easily raided and used to feed the men. The land at once appeared simple and perhaps even serene, but it would be mistaken to assume the people are similarly so. Dedicated training halls for warriors of varying backgrounds and strategies populate the towns and cities, and every village is guarded by some militarized force. Knowledge on these fighting techniques is fragmented and sourced mostly from northern infiltrators but there no doubt could be an endless amount of these strategies capable of catching the troops off guard from villages uncountable. With present knowledge, the estimates were that the Shia states can field around two to three Kikun, a force as numerous as the commands, a challenge for sure. With military technology recently improved and with full support of the marshals and the newly allied Azjakuma, it was time to strike. Recruiting standards had to be slackened for a short while to add more men to the front lines. The land of the Shia was split among dozens of states, all vying for power under the yoke of a ruler with only nominal control over its internal tribes. 
Still, it appeared that this nominal control was enough to bind its subjects to protect the ruler upon a war's declaration. Every last one of them all pledged to defend the ruler of the Xia and in turn the land itself to the last man. This report put forward a request to cease preparations and begin the campaign immediately. Based on present information, their forces could converge and unify within a matter of days. If the marshals would ensure a quick and decisive victory, they must act before the commander of the Xia could muster its splintered manpower into a united force capable of rivaling them. The bugles of war were sound and the hobgoblins marched into the misty hills to victory. No man was immortal and neither was Mogu Won. In 1449, Karg Borborn rose to the rank of Grand Marshal during war. The warrior monk enemies were surprisingly easy to defeat. The multiple small regiments were split between the myriad of temples, which the organized and focused armies of the Great Command could easily break separately. With Zhang Liu Si themselves failing to stop the tide, Many of his subjects simply refused to help and hid in the mists to watch helplessly how their lands were sieged one by one with ruthless efficiency. With the help of the Oni and their own engineering skills, the hobgoblins figured out techniques to dispel the mists that permeated these lands. The northern provinces were conquered and the orcs were moved into the newly conquered states to do what they do best and pacify the local Harimari. Karg has demonstrated exemplary leadership during the conflict, but at the next source settlement, he could prove that he had what it takes to plan and lead the second round of the campaign. He made some minor government reforms through instating officer authority privileges to the government. This would further tie the legitimacy of the state to victorious wars. If officers would be part of the privileged upper class of the command, they would have to prove themselves in strategical thinking and execution. The capital of Sarilav Khan, home of the Wolf Command, also saw a surge in development and Renaissance thoughts began to spread from the capital throughout the lands. These were very popular with the human folk and the militaristic hobgoblins had no qualms with them, as long as they resulted in more efficient building and development of the controlled lands. The Grand Marshal worked to appease and equip the tribal factions while planning a bold move in the Demon Hills. As Jakuma have been fine allies so far, but the Great Command does not truly have allies. It has enemies and it has subordinates. Karg sent an ultimatum to the ogres so that they could choose which of those they wish to be. The ogres chose wisely and they have been allowed to function as an additional slave state on the eastern flank. Their spirit binding techniques were important for repairing the high temples dotted throughout Hales and handling the restless spirits that haunted them. The ever-increasing need for Korashi chains and the Oni's secrecy regarding their production required an unfortunate but necessary solution. A contingent of troops arrived on a mission to the ogre capital of Shinukorchi in the winter of 1457. They were escorting a group of expert torturers and scholars, tasked with extracting and documenting information required to build the chains and formulate theories on solutions to increase their production. The torturers were effective and they returned with the required information. Production could now commence in the lands of the command as well. On the longer term, there were three aims. To establish the workshops themselves, to establish an institution that would regulate volatile resources, to identify and catalogue all practitioners of magic, and to improve upon the crude design of the ogres, creating better chain links with improved resource efficiency. As a small reward to Azjakuma for their eventual cooperation, Karg Borbor annexed the lands of the small sect of left-hand path cultists in Yuanzi and gifted them to the ogres. The lesser marshals proved to be harder to please than expected, so the Grand Marshal was compelled to sell them crown land in order to secure their loyalty. The small diplomatic play also aimed at fixing the matter of Grand Marshal authority internally. In 1467, the second campaign for the core lands of the Xia began. The techniques to dispel the mists in the previous campaigns allowed the marshals to supply the Kikun as they extended deeper into the hills and jungles of southern Xianjie. 
The harpies of Fembujie were a pain and kept raiding the supply lines, swooping in from the air and disappearing before the archers could punish the raiding parties. One lieutenant senior on the field determined that despite the harpies' gift of flight, their vulnerability laid in their roosts. To avoid further pointless attrition, he therefore sent his Senun to climb the mountains in the dead of night and destroy the harpy nest at Yin Chao. They fought back, but lacked the same ferocity on the defensive. The lieutenant was promoted to captain after the roost was destroyed and the harpy capital devastated. The province of Jiangsu Si was a major interest for the Grand Marshal. From Oni reports, it was a source of permanent dame steer and a crucial strategic goal for both the campaign and the Korashi chain production. Not only that, it was rumored that the local temple complex was holding a legendary sword, with a power to nullify any magic it touched. Karg Borborn himself marched into the temples to see the Kongren blade with his own eyes. Yet by the time the command forces reached the temple, the keepers have escaped with a sword into the jungles, never to be found again. While no longer possessing the blade itself, the temple was filled with texts on the keepers' blade dancing techniques, which the Grand Marshal studied while campaigning in the province. The techniques would be employed in the ranks of the Kikun and their combat formations would strike with greater poise than ever before. While other leaders in Halles engaged in extramarital affairs and petty politics, Karg Borborn studied the blade. This is why the command is victorious time and again. At the end of the war, the eastern frontier was annexed, cutting the Xiaqian off from the belligerent state of Bianfang. It was now only a matter of regrouping and cleaning up the remaining few surviving warrior monks. The choice for the Tier 3 reform was quite difficult. Centralized bureaucracy would guarantee government capacity. Decentralized bureaucracy would ensure the loyalty of the three commands. But expanding the royal court would ensure overall faster progress. After careful thought, the expanded royal court reform was adopted. The Hobgoblin state also began studying offensive military ideas. The delay in adopting the new ideas was caused by the necessity to develop lands in order to secure crown land. The Grand Marshal developed an obsessive perfectionist personality which would put a strain on the state's coffers. With a need to build a Korashi Forge magical tower in Jean Chussy, money had to be obtained fast. Some of the bills were paid by the neighboring state of Hubao and their allies. Fairly isolated diplomatically, the sorcerers in Hubao were made to give up their loot, lands and their lives. In 1477, the great Karg died and was replaced by Kyoizi Borborn. The wolf command assisted him in finding a way to leverage the claims of some of their human subjects to the western frontier of Bianfang. This casus belli allowed the command to milk some cash from them, but newly installed as great marshal, Kyoizi needed some time to prove his leadership and gain legitimacy and the support of the factions. In 1482, the hobgoblins have finally learned how to independently turn Teimarji, or Dame Steer, into Korashi, without having the need to employ the Oni. This would allow those too old or infirm to fight, veterans with no shamanistic affliction, to work in the Korashi forges and increase chain production for the glory of the state. Barely a generation since the hobgoblins broke out of the mountains, not many enjoyed life in open air, yet the command adapted and improved. The necessities of expansion required many barrack households to be built in Shamakad. For the military family units, these barracks functioned as homes, and with the multitudes who now lived in Shamakad, their underground nature slowly faded away. This change did begin to entice the ones who still called the serpent spine their home to leave the caverns and seek glory in the sun. The great migration was prepared while the Wolf Command Kikun ran errands through the deserts on top of their warg mounts. In 1488, the Shaken were ended. The Shadao had fallen and its high temples were confiscated. Only a few independent stragglers remained. The martial skills of the conquered would from then on serve the Great Command. 
From a point of total control of the Misty Hills, southern and eastern Hales lay vulnerable to the formidable war machine. The Orkish slave states were moved further south, and the gift of tribute from newly conquered lands kept their tribes happy. Many orcs would be left behind after their forced migrations. These orcs within hobgoblin borders were fierce warriors but unfit for the regimented life deemed by the state. They would prove to be more useful when toiling fields of rice than fields of battle, and thus they were encouraged to grow their crops in peace and supply the front lines with food. The third campaign was agreed upon, and the strike for Shamakad was put on the planning table by the Wolf Command. Special commissions were granted to the Lions and the Wolves, and war against Rajnadaga was declared. They were allied with the remains of Bimlau. Bimlau, the keepers of the great necropolis, was recently humiliated by Buvauri and was severely weakened and exposed. The ruined kingdom held two major cities, Sharaja and Sarnihanpur. Sarnihanpur held the title of oldest city in Rahen, and such a pedigree would make its defenders hold out heroically, mounting the hobgoblin casualties during its siege. The great command decided to commit to breaking the city and its engineers had just the solution. A mammoth ramp extending from the rolling plains that surrounded the city to arc over its walls. Using this tool, the defenses of the city were rendered useless and the capital of the so-called Nadim Raj was efficiently captured and ruthlessly devastated. Its granaries had been yoked to the command's supply lines and its vaults would fund future campaigns. Its people would be made to labor in the fields and mines in the service of the great command. Bimlau was vassalized and Rajnadaga cut in half at the end of the war. Yet the Grand Marshal Moguwon's warnings did come to pass. With the conquests in West Shamakad, the perceived aggressive expansion of the command spiked in Rahen threatening a coalition of human kingdoms that could spell disaster in a spectacular fashion. The fourth government reform was also adopted in 1488. General education would allow new institutions to spread faster in the state and to bring further prosperity and power gains. The expanded royal court reform paid off in time to prepare for the colonization drive from West Kannur. With the latest conquests, the statocracy of the great command reached an incredible size and the thinkers of the time reflected on the burden of empire. Humble roots could not hope to anchor a tree of stone. The drums of war beat ever on, a rhythmic symphony of blood strewn upon the fields below. Bands of the warrior race crossed the face of Rahen, the three commands an iron will behind them. Never have these people been such a sight to behold. Yet with that glory came a great price. Those shoulders grew weary and only the tribes may lift the weight of them. But could the three commands truly manage such a feat? The following conquests of the campaign targeted the kingdom of Sarnavan. They were not nearly as well equipped for war as Rajnadaga, but they benefited from an alliance with the leader of the Raj. At the end of this war, Sarnavan was completely annexed and the capital of Denizhansar was plundered. This was the point where the anti-Hobgoblin coalition became reality in Rahin. The humans and the Harimari states understood the threat at their borders and they trembled. At the turn of the century, the Wolf Command took charge through their Grand Marshal representative, Fazimitsu Wolfborn. His mandate began with a historical breakthrough in the Jade Mines, after decades of spending diplomatic points in easing the tension between Black Steppe and Stolen Gem, the two slave states finally succeeded in ending their feud. The Warbringer became a peacemaker, and the two goblin tribes officialized a new age of peace through royal marriage. This would also relieve some pressure from the command's logistical machine, not having to worry about any more fights in the Serpent Spine and fully committing to the ongoing campaigns. In the freshly conquered Misty Hills, the new Grand Marshal ordered the construction of new troop barracks. The Xia spent centuries developing their techniques, yet they fell within a handful of years. Their shrouded temples were repurposed not to teach their failed philosophies, but to teach them the ways of a great command. 
Fazimitsu paused in the temple's doorway and ran his hand along the damp stone. It was a warm day, but the mists still clung tightly to the hills of Shanjie. He turned back for a moment, nodding to the Nosunin Unta that they will stay outside before proceeding into the building. The temple's master was bowed low in the dojo, a blade on the ground before him. The Grand Marshal, saying not a word, picked it up and gave it a few practice strokes. The handle seemed worn, but the edge remained sharp. Was the same true of Xianjie, a conquered land whose edge remained well honed? That was the question the temple's master had beseeched the marshals to answer, a question which went all the way up the chain of command. The two great campaigns that crushed the Xia saw countless of the temple's soldiers slain, but most of the buildings themselves still stood. Did they have anything to offer the great command in training and in practice? Or should they have been demilitarized, as with so many other conquered peoples, allowed to teach philosophy or work on artisan goods, but never to raise blade or spear again? The Grand Marshal grunted, signaling the aged master to raise her head. She met his eyes, face expressionless. Fazimitsu's choice was clear. He laughed and declared that he would never say no to sparring and neither would the great command. The warrior monks were free to train and spar if they wished. While waiting for truces within Shamakad, the Grand Marshal continued the conquest of the remaining independent Shaken duchies. But after a few conquests, riders arrived from Sarilav Han and demanded attention. There were rumors of shamans organizing a revolt within the state. There was no definitive proof, but there was no denying it. Rumors of magic wielder conspiracies were more and more common, and that couldn't have been a coincidence. 1508 was the year that saw the strike in Shamakad campaign to its conclusion. Fazimitsu Wolfborn thus proved his leadership in the eyes of the factions. The same year saw an interesting development in the province of Kamapar, in the middle of the old Nadimraj. Kamapar was the origin of the Orange Sash school of the high philosophy creed. The command's ideological missionaries have been debating the locals for months and eventually discovered that the local philosophies blended surprisingly well with the godlost ways. The orange sash taught the vital importance of the family. Godlost taught the same. The orange sash taught obedience to a single group above all else. Godlost taught the same. The orange sash was well accepted across Halis. Godlost was not. Not yet. Following the advice of a Boer advisor, the state decided to exploit the opportunity caused by these similarities to spread the correct faith faster within the command's borders. The hobgoblins of the command follow a unique creed. God Lost is part of the atheistic group, together with the thought and with the black doctrine. It is a denouncement of the shamanic ways of the goblin cult. Society is instead forged into a rigid structure, with family and country taking precedence over religious practices and cosmic powers. A disciplined and loyal attitude is revered and any disobedience is harshly punished. The God Lost is structured in a series of teachings that all are expected to adhere to, but some may put greater emphasis on one over the other. As a baseline, God Lost grants a bit of discipline and plus two tolerance of heathens, very handy for conquests, as essentially everyone else will be a heathen. The teachings function as in other religions, with each ruler having to choose a unique teaching. Some highlights are imperial teaching, for extra aggressive expansion mitigation and province war score cost reduction, or industrious for peacetime construction cost and goods produced bonuses. Domestic for extra manpower recovery speed and legitimacy. Later in the game, nationalist thought can also be unlocked through missions for less war, exhaustion and years of separatism. Disaster struck in 1512. Only three years prior, Grand Marshal Yuto Lionborn focused resources on bringing the institution of colonialism in Shalava in the heart of Shamakad. But recent expansion was too fast, and Korashi production did not keep up. With the rise of the shamans, war has come to the command. 
The adversary was now within the country and had to be dealt with. Magic was a useful tool on the field of battle, but with the shamans in open revolt, this powerful weapon was turning the whole house ablaze. Fear and mistrust, paired with a sudden breaking of order within the military system, put the command in serious peril, army morale and shock damage being the first victims. The rebels started relatively slowly, with mage contingents freely taking arms in various provinces and at times succeeding at draining the provinces of power. In other cases, anti-shaman militias would devastate their hometowns. In trying to help, they would actively put the command's orderly operation in jeopardy. They also had to be put down by the army. The only way to stop this madness was to urgently find a way to increase Korashi chain production, whatever the cost. The internal war escalated in Paraj with the Chandra of Many Hands rebellion. Growing up, Chandra knew when things were darkest, that was when destiny called. He and his parents were part of a small cult that venerated Jagadipendra, the black bowman of Rahen, and last of the Oracle Kings. They thought that he hadn't died, merely disappeared and would return to his followers when they needed him most. The command's invasion seemed like such a time. Mighty fortresses fell, the best of Rahen's troops were slaughtered. None could stand before this implacable foe. And so, the cult practiced rituals, prayed harder than ever. But the black bowmen never came. And their behavior saw them executed as suspected mages by the occupiers. Chandra only escaped due to a lucky break and a wise mentor. Enough waiting for someone else to save the day. It was on him now. He gathered a band of allies, a plucky Sarisungi rogue, a grizzled Harimari veteran, signed a pact for power with a Rakshasa and came to lead what is known as the Many Hands Rebellion. His is a story of resolve in the face of struggle, of determination in the face of despair. And it's a story that had only one ending. To be trampled into the dust, his followers executed, the prospect of another rebellion firmly extinguished. The second escalation happened in Sir with a Shaded Mist rebellion. Hobgoblin guards closely watched the Oni as they crisscrossed the land, administrating conquered high temples, but it seemed they did not watch those demons and their servants well enough. Zhong Wen had been a merchant before an incident in the shadowy city of Cha Jin left him cursed. Not having lost his eyes like most that city left behind, but with his gaze instead affixed permanently to the spirit realm. He was a successful tool to his Oni masters, one they did not pay attention to. But now, midst the chaos, he had fled their grasp and used all he learned from their lands to raise Shanjie against the command. Just another example of how even a subservient mage is a threat and an example not to be ignored, even once the Shaded Mist's uprising was snuffed out. The rebels fought fiercely and bravely, but were eventually defeated by the Hobgoblin troops, their lands fully sieged, they were integrated back into the larger state, though the rebellion was not fully quelled. Having the Korashi process mastered for more than 10 years, the Grand Marshal summoned a skilled natural scientist who studied the process in the last decade. The Lion Command demanded to see the designs for more efficient links for the chains and the scientist provided as they asked. They implemented the reform in the workshops and the Korashi chain production increased. This action contained the Shaman's Rebellion, but it would only do so temporarily. More was needed, and the sooner the better or the Shamans could rise again. For the fifth government reform, the Lions were appointed as the main administrator cadre. The Lion Command will inspire royalty in the estates due to their charisma and experience in leadership. In 1517, a beast of a hobgoblin rose throughout the ranks to the role of Grand Marshal. Moguwon Borborn, a 566 monster, was ready to embark on the next grand campaign. Following the rise of the shamans and the recent conquests, Rahen had formed a coalition, but the Grand Marshal thought of a legal workaround. He attacked the march of Tugayasa, that was not part of the coalition due to their vassal status or due to their oracular haze. Either way, the Raj was easily routed and with them locked in a truce, the coalition collapsed. As soon as that happened, the final two independent Shaken were erased from the map. This had two advantages. Two less players to enable future coalitions 
and a ground connection to Bimlau, the vassal state in the south. Most of their lands have been conquered in the past by the Free Republic of Buvauri. Their troops foolishly engaged in a war with the Raj, it was the perfect opportunity to strike and retake large swathes of land for little to no aggressive expansion. Returning the lands had a secondary benefit of increasing friendship between the command and Bimlau, preparing them for formal annexation. The formal process of demonstration was also initiated at this time. The purpose was not diplomatic in nature. The purpose was to accrue as much reform progress as possible. All the victories in the past seven years were good, but it was not how the command worked. Reactionary wars were not honorable. It was time to plan and act. So a new settlement of swords was called. Bianfang was on the menu. The command already had a foothold on the western edge of Yanshen. The fortress of Hubao was intended to protect the entrance to the navigable portion of the Yan River, but it would prove to be its vulnerability. Yanshen was a divided and chaotic land ripe for conquest. The marshals commissioned the construction of a river fleet to encircle the White Dragon's capital and make its siege quick and painless. This war was honorable. The armies of the Bianfang possessed much greater organizational cohesion than any of the rabble encountered so far. They fought with a unity and ferocity that was admirable, but were unable to match the absolute discipline of the Hobgoblin war machine. Their warriors and imperial ambitions would be further repurposed for the conquest of the rest of Yanshen. Also important for the campaign was the control of the capital of Jincheng, held by the vampire lords of Jinkyu. With the river under control, the fortifications crumbled under the cannons of the river fleet. Scouts successfully mapped the mysterious lands of the masked riders of the Shuvush. These cursed lands saw one terrible master replace another. But in the end, the vampires were completely crushed and order has arrived to the plains. The Boer Marshal's visit to the front lines had been pleasant and edifying. Though the reports that littered the war room were detailed, they could not capture the true experience of being on campaign and nor could they include every detail. Sometimes it was those details thought least important that proved decisive. As such, the marshal was deep in thought and he and his honor guard marched back to Sarilav Khan, scarcely seeing the scenery as he thought of strategy and tactics. And then, as their march took them through a small valley, they were ambushed. A human voice yelled a warning, but marshal's retinue scarcely had time to draw their blades before the rebels were upon them. Though their foes were disorganized and poorly armed, they also outnumbered the marshal's men, at least three to one. The marshal slew one rebel, and then another, and then another. But even so, he saw his guards fall around him. Stab one rebel, slash a second, and kick away the third. But already another had a short sword raised, about to strike. And then, like lightning out of a clear blue sky, the human was pierced by a well-thrown spear. With a moment to breathe, the marshal put his guard back up, readying for a second round. But he was amazed to see the rebels falling from an attack from the rear by a sole human fighting with unparalleled ability. Seeing the tides turn, the rebels scrambled to kill the hated hobgoblin, and while they scored a few nasty slices on his arm and chest, in minutes the attack was over. The man named Atar Daya Gakkar bowed low in formal apology before the marshal. He had tracked the rebel bands for weeks but did not know their destination or would have interfered sooner. To atone for the deaths of the hobgoblin troops which he failed to avert, he would serve as the marshal's escort for the remainder of the march. Gakkar seemed to see himself a man who had failed despite the dozens of rebels he had slain today. But looking at the man, the Boer Marshal knew what he saw. A human with honor. That man was worthy to command troops. Of course, the campaign was a smashing success and loot was abundant. A second idea set was chosen. Espionage would be the second focus of the great command. Infiltrators were necessary to prepare campaigns and soften up the attitudes of the people on the receiving end of aggression. Siege ability and aggressive expansion mitigation was paramount to future success. In 1531, Ziu Borborn was appointed Grand Marshal. 
He followed the lenient stance of the God-loss teachings, and he opened up discussions about the role of humans in Hobgoblin society. This was the consequence of the proof that some humans could display the same discipline and honor that was required by the statocracy. So if they could be loyal and valorous, then maybe they would earn a place in the war machine. In the same year, migration from the mountains to the plains of Shamakad was complete. The lion war camp moved out of Gronstunad as well. With no whole goblins left in the Jade Mountains, it was the perfect opportunity to unite the two goblin slave states and install a united Jade March. Their new task was to prospect for the precious resource Mithril and deliver it to the forges and foundries in the south, to be fashioned into weapons and armors of superior quality. And in the 16th century, no foundry complex was greater than the one in Sarilavhan. Growing over time to supply materials to the massive army, it rose to epic proportions, benefiting from proximity to the rich iron mines of Kradungur and the Serpent Spine. Strong forts were spread around the heart of the command and the families dug into their newly settled lands. In 1540, the war room debated the best new target of the Great Campaign. Cannons have been developed and proving their worth in the field when aimed at fortifications. It was time they were tested against the mighty elephants of Gavanash. West of the Karuniana lied the Gavanaji Plain, a vast arid land that dominated the Middle Rahen. It was from there that the trumpeting elephants originated. Sovereignty in the region was split between a number of squabbling elephant lords, making it especially vulnerable, regardless of the vastness of their herds. The Gavanaji were themselves trampled by their own beasts, who panicked at the roaring sound of cannons. As powerful as the elephants were, they were a danger to all thinking creatures, and the command decided to tightly curtail their movement and keep them under strict guard. The elephants would serve more as a propaganda tool, to show Rahen that Gavanaj was truly tamed, even if the hobgoblins would never truly master the art of the Mahouts. After the northern guard was broken, the cohesion of the Raj overall took a massive blow. As a result, little wars broke out for the title of Raja. Good. Let them fight. Petty politics proved to be the scourge of the so-called civilized time and again, and the command was ready to capitalize on their weakness. The command Kikun elite guards were tasked to reinforce the southern and eastern edges of the state with fortifications and hobgoblin colonies. New major Korashi chain workshop facilities were also installed around Sir and the Ogre Hills. This ramp up in production would put an end to Raheni magic and permanently ensure the obedience of magic users, preventing further disasters. The shamans would learn an eternal lesson that it was better to die for the command than to live for themselves. For decades, the tribes had fallen into place, naturally filling roles to create an organic tapestry. It was beautiful in its efficiency and structure. Hobgoblins possessed a unity of purpose, allowing them to reach above their station in the name of progress. This arrangement brought the command to prosperity, but progress was based on a delicate balance. Should the unity of the tribes grow stressed beyond limit, only utter disaster could follow. To transition the great nation to one of modern governance, the act of division was enabled in 1544 formally dividing the rights of administration and purpose between the commands. Boer command agents have granted claims on Lot de Kang, and the Grand Marshal used them to declare war in the south and take the opportunity to forcefully vassalize a severely crippled Arav Kelin. This provided a solid foothold in the southern Lupulan jungles and a good engine of reconquest in the region to be exploited in the future. The claims included Lapnam Amrik, capital of Lot the Kang, where many dishonorable hobgoblins were calling home. Lapnam Amrik was a major hub for mercenaries to be hired by rich purses. There was to be no quarter for such a disgrace. Criminals and outlaws, all hobgoblin mercenaries found in the city, were immediately and mercilessly executed. In the core lands, orcs and humans intermingled for decades and created quite a large community of half-orcs. They were just as suitable to work as slaves, like their orcish ancestors. But they could be used to do smarter, more productive work as well. The state acknowledged that, 
and would continue to observe these communities with interest. With Gavanaj under control, 1548 was the beginning of the campaign to subjugate the porcelain cities in Dujat along the Karuniana. A number of Grand Marshals rose to the rank of leaders of the command but died soon after they were installed. Yojimbo of the Wolf, Zurshin of the Boar, and finally Zomazu Boarborn. The porcelain cities and their surroundings were incredibly rich and conveniently disunited, an ideal combination for an aspiring conqueror. Having a foothold in Pordatti, close to the source of the river, it was only a matter of following it downstream, past Tugayasa, Sarisung, the Kea Torda crossing and finally Kiraspid. This campaign would not be quick. Internally, the state saw major changes in its society. The humans proved that they could learn the values and teachings of the command. Being a Kedarid, Sikai, Rajnadhid or whatever little culture was irrelevant. What was important to the state is to be Buhyun, an honorable other. And this could be taught. The command could install new edicts in different states to forcefully teach their doctrines to the humans. Three distinct cultures emerged from this. The Kusonin, the Kintonan, and the Ikaniwagain. Each would serve the state with bravery and cunning, and each would be granted their own war camps to train and aid in the expansion of the nation. The poetic Kusonin in the west, the sneaky Kintonan in the south, and the stalwart Ikaniwagain marksmen in the east. One of the first cities to fall in the Dujat campaign was Tugayasa. The oracular order was expert in the magic of divination and the mountaintop temples were used by all nations in Rahin to predict the future. Unfortunately for them, the future of Hales would end with the command and their ways were not useful anymore. The oracle was slaughtered and their temple was burned to the ground, to the horror of Hales. They may have not been adept with magic as the hobgoblins knew it, but the policy against shamans did not change. The great city of Sarisung was next to fall, then Enthuvi. With these cities under control, a great highway project was initiated in Xianjie. The reconstruction of the golden highway of the elven conquerors would serve the armies of the command. Many forts were decommissioned in the region and the push continued while the laws of the Ninun kept converting the disparate human cultures to the Vuhiun. The chaos on the river also left Fangban exposed and it was conquered too. But quick advancements in Dujat were terribly slow due to the nature of the Raj and its web of truces. The administrative burden also expanded to three new tribes created through the authority of the Division Act. New war camps were installed to house the headquarters of the newest commands. Rayav Hatimana on the bank of the Karuniana would serve as home of the Tiger Command. Zhao Yun in the heart of Xianjie would house the Elephant Command. And in Chatsin on the Yanhe would be the war camp of the Dragon Command. The Tiger Command was the tribe that would learn from the mistakes of the complacent yet wise Harimari subjects. By focusing on administration and education, the tigers would work to instill in every citizen the values of discipline and order. Separate from the established triarchy, the elephant command's duty revolved around construction, fortification and the transportation of raw materials for processing or for use by the Sunyanin. The very walls that stood between savagery and civilization would be the product of the elephants, and the foundries of the command would be staffed by the greatest minds they had to offer. The Dragon Command in the east would use the schools and universities of the Yanshen eunuchs to venture into the realm of natural science. Largely matriarchal, the dragons would prove to be the keenest thinkers and the best engineers and inventors of the hobgoblin machine, providing the most advanced machines of war. The next tier of government reforms encouraged further meritocratic advancements through the deliberative assembly of the commands. Participation in the workings of the state would not only benefit the larger administration as a whole, but also ensure loyalty. At the same time, 
Separated from their serpent's plume, the hobgoblins learned to change their diet and include grain and rice as staple foods instead. This would happen gradually, but it was a necessary step in their continuous acclimatization to life in the sun. The establishment of the Dragon Command saw the first female Grand Marshal rise to power in 1577. Noriko, Dragonborn's first act was to restructure the trading focuses of the state. Collecting trade in the heart of the Karuniana and funneling goods from the rest of the country was a very lucrative change indeed. Noriko's daughter, Hikari, after countless achievements on the Yanshin frontiers, approached the assembly of commands in Sarilav Khan's Grand Hall and demanded that her distinguished deeds be acknowledged and be appointed as second in command to her mother. The daughter of the dragon's defiance of her mother and the strict rights of succession in the command shook the tribes. Direct succession was never permitted in the command, but her successes were also incontestable. Not only did she prove prowess in strategic planning and battle since the age of 16, but she also penned numerous treaties on the nature of modern warfare. Kintonan Shinobi returned from an expedition in the Tree of Stone with detailed maps of the tunnels acquired from the dwarves. The aim was to find more lucrative mithril veins to be granted to the Jade March, yet none were discovered. Bimlau was formally annexed in 1578. On the campaign map, Noriko ended the conquest of Dujat with a swift, bold move. The capital of Denijansar was also conquered. No longer would the Raj interfere with the expansion of the Great Command. The Orc slave states were moved into Denizansar as a final insult to the Harimari. The rest of Gavanaj and Dujat were ripe for conquest, and a swift chain of victories resulted in enormous overextension and thus many rebel uprisings. The army of the command fought them just as fiercely as they would external foes. The war room convened again, and the factions brought forth their plans for the next campaign. The region south of the declining Raj and the defeated Shiaken standed as the gateway to the great plain of Thindikai. The two major fortresses in the region were Bimlau and Lapnam Amrik. Both of them were already under the state's control. The Bomdan and their nest of traitors was already pacified, and the only empire in Bomdan was ruled by hobgoblins. The campaign was well planned, but it was over before it began. The Wolf Command proposed to strike and re-enslave the Bugvauri, continuing down the river to its rich delta made perfect sense, so Noriko prepared the invasion south. The merchant lords of the Grand Republic of Bugvauri were a thorn in her side. They were incredibly rich and motivated, but their coin and mighty fleet would significantly add to the command's strength. Hobgoblins employed river fleets before, but one that could brave the oceans was never tested. A trained warrior can slay a dozen of his foes in a given battle. An elite wargrider might near a hundred kills contingent on a well-timed charge. But how many lives did Noriko take today with the orders she just signed? Thousands? Tens of thousands if she erred or had a stroke of brilliance. Such is the burden and responsibility of leadership and being the Grand Marshal of the Great Command. That thought did not fade as Noriko returned home from the command tent, but it did become less salient. She checked the house and it was empty, despite the late hour. With a smile, she walked around the dwelling to the dojo behind it. There she was victim of a savage ambush. A trained warrior ran at her, weapon in hand. Noriko's smile widened. Her four-year-old son came to a sharp halt a few feet away, eyes widening. The training sword, just a little longer than a dagger, dropped to the young man's side and he gave his mother a solemn bow. As her son kneeled, Noriko's eyes swept across the dojo, her husband sketching blueprints in the late afternoon sun. Her nephews, sparring, paused, heads bowed in proper respect to the Grand Marshal. She waved them back to their training and then, with a laugh, picked up her son and swung him through the air. The sun was warm, her son's own laughter infectious, and the life in the great command was as it should always have been, a life under the sun.
Meanwhile, in the south, cannons roared and armies marched along the banks of the Great River. Escaped slaves used to find safe harbor in the Caruniana Delta, but that would end with the advancement of the hobgoblins and the rich ports were enchained by the ruthless war machine. Noriko's rule was nothing less than legendary. Sramaya itself was given to the Bloodsong orcs. They would be tasked to capture and enslave the unworthy to the horror of the local population. The engineers would use Sramaya as a base to build and learn for future expansions up and down the Raheni coast. The Vuhyun Kikun, the honorable humans, were granted official war camp privileges and the slave states were trained to also convert and teach their human subjects the ways of the command to the betterment of all life and for stability. Yet stability was in grave danger. In 1592, the war room received a messenger with a troubling letter. Noriko and the marshals of the wolf, boar and lion commands were discussing the reports recently received from the successful campaign in Buvauri. Lands had to be redistributed, governors assigned and descent crushed. They expected to be left to their deliberations as usual, but the other three commands composed the letter Noriko received. They were complaining about their roles in the management of the new territories, requested positions in the war room and proclaimed that the current state of affairs was untenable. This insubordination would not stand and the Dragon, Elephant and Tiger Command's loyalties were faltering rapidly. The War Room had work to do nonetheless and the upcoming Raheni Coast campaign plans were discussed late into the night. After the letter debacle in the War Room, Noriko had a few things to think about. Normally these affairs would not justify a moment's extra thought. However, all three subordinate marshals had jumped over themselves to schedule private meetings with the Grand Marshal as if that could make any difference. Of course, Noriko was not stupid and they were all aware of how badly visible disrespect would go over. So they needed to listen and they needed to at least seem like there was a chance to convince them. First, there was the Tiger Marshal, the one and only Zurshin Tigerborn. He came with no plans and a determined glint in his eye. Zurshin set an hourglass on the table and began waxing large about Raheni jungle combat Noriko did not really care. Upon wrapping things up, Zurshin finally tied it together. They desired to integrate all these tactics into the Tiger Doctrine. Against whom? Noriko knew that going along with this was not such a wise idea, but maybe a few well-placed words could keep the subordinates sated. So she let him speak, but then dismissed him without any concessions. A few months later, he rose before an audience of notable Raheni governors, both human and hobgoblin, and recited the Dujat proclamation. It is with a clear conscience and heavy heart that I protest the foolishly short-sighted decision made by the Grand Marshal Noriko to deny the Tiger Command its rightful place alongside our brothers and sisters, letting the followers of the high philosophy fester in poverty as hobgoblins from Shamakad dominate the upper castes. We ask not for privilege or status, but mere coexistence with those who sought to plant us here in a land that wishes our return to the caves from which we came. We ask not for strife, yet it finds its way to us. It is my regret to inform my distinguished guests that the Tiger Command shall henceforth formally sever itself from the existing military command structure, creating a parallel hierarchy headed by yours truly. So the Tiger Command split its administrative apparatus from the core in Sarilav Khan in defiance of the war room. Even if still formally pledging allegiance to the Great Command, this event came as a shock to the Grand Marshal and her commanders. Truly regrettable. Next came the Elephant Marshal. It was not a particularly busy day for Noriko. Most of their schedule was routine, save for an impressive chunk of time that needed to be carved out for a meeting, at the behest of who was meeting them, no less. In walked Tion Kun, elephant born, his approach accentuated by the crinkle crackle of paper. Oh, lovely, thought Noriko. We were going to take up the whole schedule. The Grand Marshal watched elephant born set down his documents, rearrange them into some ineffable order, then finally fix his gaze onto his commander. Noriko tried not to let her disinterest show. The bomb had very capable fortresses, Tion Kun explained, and he had reason to believe that he could improve on them even further, creating a nigh unbreakable citadel that could be used to great effect. With a proper approval, he would oversee a prototype built around the elephant war camp. He already had a few drafts here, as he explained in painstaking detail. 
around the war camp. So that was what he was getting at. Noriko's gut told her this might be a bad idea, probably. It was a bad idea, and the marshal was dismissed. There were no funds that could be allocated for this project on such a short notice. Not long after, with a punctuality that seemed cultivated, Hikari Dragonborn arrived precisely when she said she would. After some brief formalities, her attitude seemed dedicated to carrying them out, as opposed to simply doing them to be over with them. It almost made Noriko care. Hikari began to speak. Noriko did her best to pretend to listen, if only to know the numbers if Hikari decided to quiz her on it. Perhaps the upright, unmoving expression made things a bit too obvious. Even if it did, Hikari did not seem to notice, or if she did, she did not show it. Once more, I am imploring you to take the cause of canon engineering seriously. If the dragons cannot find new innovations, then nobody else could. Well, since it was an open-ended query, there would be no questions. Noriko was not surprised that all of this was about that artillery. Her gaze met hers for a moment. Best not to give them the cold shoulder. At least it would be so much easier to leave this to a less of an upstart, anyway. A few months later, Noriko's life would end as she drew her final breath peacefully in her bed. Her replacement was General Bochiro of the Boar. He was a fierce negotiator and an accomplished general, but lacked Noriko's legendary status and according to statocratic laws, still had to prove his legitimacy. Not only did he have to face the defiant tigers, but the Oni also showed signs of unrest. It is not often that a slave of a hobgoblin raises their fist to their master, yet murmurs of a great insurrection only grow. The once mystical demon hills have been thoroughly tamed and muzzled, or so the hobgoblins once thought. Centuries of militaristic tradition do not die so easily and resistance appears to be second nature to the demons of the misty hills. Should the opportunity present itself, rebellion does not seem unthinkable and such an opportunity appeared to be rapidly approaching. The command would keep a close eye on this situation. 1593 saw two more proclamations from the Elephant and the Dragon commands. In Lapnam Amrik, before a crowd of soldiers, Vukhyun and Hobogoblin alike, Tion Kun unraveled a scroll and began to read. Children of the Elephant, Despite being as powerful, as wealthy and advanced as all three upper commands combined, we are denied our rightful place in the Great Command. No matter how much we produce, no matter how effective our works are, they are taken for granted, as if these are things anyone can do. But I say no more. Effective immediately, we are to sever ourselves from the Great Command such that we finally might claim our rightful place in the world. Who of your number shall fight for their sovereignty? The entire crowd roared their approval. In Sicheng, the daughter of legendary Noriko stood atop a stage, rows and rows of commanders, engineers and inventors sitting before her, listening. I stand before you all to deliver unfortunate tidings. Over the course of the Dragon Command's existence, the Upper Commands have stifled our innovations, our inventions, even denied our resilience. I ask you all, would they have denied us if we were one of the three Upper Commands? No, until we are given the presence we deserve, not least of which is the free access to the famous War Room, then we must refuse to constitute a part of the Great Command. If they do not believe that our command is sufficiently experienced to provide counsel, then we will need to prove that we can provide it in droves. Who is with me? One clap, then another, and another, all the way until the audience's applause was deafening. A simple man would panic, but hobgoblins were not simple men. Bochiro had to act fast. Losing so much land to the rebellious subordinates, he had to order emergency construction of regimental camps throughout Shamakad to be able to contain the loss of force limit capacity and maintain a strong standing army. The three commands were each mustering forces of similar magnitudes and it was unclear what were their plans. The only thing that was obvious was that their armies will not serve the Grand Marshal. It was one bright afternoon 
when a parcel addressed to the Grand Marshal arrived at the war room. The courier, breathless and drenched in sweat. It was not the odor of the package that first caught Bochiro's attention, but rather the petrified look in the courier's eyes. There was no need to gaze into the box, for through the cracks in the lid it was already clear that this parcel contained the head of the Great Command's envoy to the Tiger Command. A crude way to declare war, but the message certainly came across. Bochiro sent orders to the marshals to raise their armies, donned his armor and marched south. Death was coming to the traitors. Hi everybody, Pukebeard here. The command is often the final boss of a campaign in Ambenar. What better final boss suited for the command than three other commands united against it? Welcome to the Great Insubordination Disaster. This disaster has some ongoing malices which are more or less irrelevant, but the obvious problem is that the Great Command is at war with three other ones. Each of them has a comparable army size and is very motivated to win. To defeat the disaster, all you need is to siege down the three enemy capitals. Sieging a capital will immediately integrate the respective command, taking them out of the war and returning their lands to you. Easy, right? WRONG! Each of the capitals has a beautiful modifier which makes it impenetrable. So what can be done? Well, there are three tasks that need to be performed in order to weaken the expert defenses of each of the capitals, so technically nine tasks in total. Common between them is the fact that they need to be encircled and their supply depots must be sabotaged. This is simply a matter of sieging down and controlling the provinces around the target capital and one more province upstream of it, which will be highlighted on the map if you click the question mark sign next to the respective task decisions. A third task is specific to each of the capitals. Against the Tiger Command's capital, one must bring 30 cannon regiments to the province under siege to unleash a concentrated barrage that will melt its walls and weaken it. This is maybe the simplest of them all. Against the Elephant Command's capital, one must employ Dwarven engineering to overcome the Elephantine Wall defenses. This requires either control of the hold of Vercalozovar or a diplomatic solution, which means that the owner of Vercalozovar must have 50 or more opinion of the Great Command. The diplomatic route does cost extra cash and diplomatic power points, but if it has to be done, then it has to be done. The Dragon Command's capital is defended by a battery of cannons, so in order to have a chance to defeat it, the iron supply of the dragons must be sabotaged. This means that all provinces that produce iron in the enemy lands must be captured. The odds may be stacked against you, but with some preparation and foresight the disaster can be overcome. Even so, it is wonderfully intense, for the enemy armies are terrible in quality and quantity and will certainly make advances into the Great Command's lands. Thankfully, the slave states will cooperate, at first. If, for any reason, their liberty desire would increase beyond 50%, then the slave states will also betray you and declare their own wars, taking advantage of the chaos. Therefore, keep their liberty desire low no matter the cost. As Jakuma in particular can be a very valuable asset, their high fort defense can stall the enemy commands pretty efficiently. When the insubordinate commands spawn, the first victim will be income, but more importantly army force limit. I would recommend investing in regimental camps and state coring everything, in case there were any territories left in Shamakad. This is clearly preferable to deleting regiments to avoid economic collapse. Another tip is that you may move troops deep inside enemy territory before the disaster. When the insubordination begins, they will not be black flagged and can start sieging immediately, circumventing any forward defenses. It might be wise to simply concentrate all of the army around one capital and not leave stragglers out to be sniped by the rival armies. Having the army concentrated can make encircling and sabotaging supplies quick and safe. I started with the Tiger Command because they had the easiest of tasks and could be taken out the fastest of the three. Another important aspect is to manage the relationship with Verkalo Zovar. I could not declare an easy war against them and they were cradled by the Elephant Command so I chose the diplomatic route. Even if monstrous fully improving with them gifting gold and proclaiming guarantees and such did allow me to achieve the plus 50 opinion of them and get the Dwarven expertise needed against the Elephants. Another final warning is related to the encirclement tasks. The enemy defensive bonuses can be restored if encirclement is broken, for example, so keeping the whole army in one region is 
that much more valuable to defend against enemy siege breaking. During gameplay this felt like the mother of all disasters. It was incredibly intense. The combined enemy armies would have trampled mine underfoot and eventually did a few times so I had to reload until I got it right. Of course the first time seeing this one is completely unprepared to face it but once one understands the tasks it all clicks into place. I give this disaster a maximum 5 on the Hecho scale. It's unique, it's challenging and most importantly it makes one feel clever when achieving victory against it. Not sure if the AI can ever reach the point where this disaster fires but it would be certainly interesting to see the four commands wrecking Hales as AIs. The end of the disaster will reward a 10 year buff that I completely missed until there were about 4 years left of it. The Jingo fervor makes the victorious command thirsty for war so they can declare while truces are active without consequence for 10 whole years. I did not take advantage of this but if you play the command know that this is a reward at the end of the disaster. I also ended up at war with the elephant commands vassal Yarishar after integrating them which was weird but uh, not the end of the world. Anyway back to our narrative. Zurshin, Hikari and Tion Kun, the insubordinate marshals, were each captured in turn. They were each given a final chance to redeem their honor and each made the correct choice. They were all unchained and allowed to take their own lives and wash the shame of their tribes with their own blood. Hikari's death was perhaps the most tragic of all. The daughter of the dragon would have had a chance to lead the command in a historical fashion and she squandered it all because of her pride. Such a shame. With the truce of 1600 behind him, Grand Marshal Bochiro began constructing the first fleet of the command and set his focus on completing the conquest of the Raheni coast, west of Sramaya. Few hobgoblins have ever seen a coast, much less a sea. The very concept of such a vast body of water was a relatively new addition to their conception of Halan. As for most of their existence, they only knew the dry air of northern Rahen. The marshals were skeptical of tales of a body of water without end, blaming the naive romanticism of the men of the south. The fact remained that vast wealth was housed in the cities along the Rahen coast, metropolises of decadence and degeneracy. They would be cleansed of the corruption which complacency has wrought. With naval ability lacking, the command had to enlist the Gerunanin for help building an armada of galleons to begin establishing a proper naval presence. The land known as Harimar's Cradle was utterly foreign. For centuries the hobgoblins have known only forested hinterlands or Halesi hills. Here their soldiers pushed through a bizarre landscape of twisting vines and towering trees sustained by near constant rainfall. A green hell where disease seemed as deadly as the claws of the Harimari tiger. Some men were rotting from inside out and their very skin would fall from their bones from sicknesses previously unknown. Regardless, the command endured. The vines would be torn and the jungles would be tamed in the name of the state. The ports of Rahen fell like dominoes before the battered but victorious great command. And while the war raged in the south, the three new tribes regained their loyalty fully but were crippled, never to achieve the status of significant factions. In 1609, through the Tugayasa petition, they were allowed to contribute with their expertise in the war council in exchange for eternal loyalty but nothing more. To the east lay the historical lands of the League of Yansin, a small but populous alliance of Yan held together by fear of foreign conquerors and complacency. In 1611 they were completely dominated by the state of Xiang Nu, who gave up the seats of the old league. Xiang Nu was snapped like a twig and the local eunuchs have fled while the people submitted. Their cunning, foresight, treachery and intelligence would serve the command from then on. Among the more valuable prizes of the campaign was the Yang Cheng College, a prestigious center of learning. The Sunyanin requested to study the mathematical curriculum of this institution and learn to better calculate the aim of artillery to avoid hitting the friendly front lines as much as possible, to the benefit of the army 
and the Yangcheng College. Following the campaign, the Golden Highway renovation project was also expanded in the region. In 1613, Zoburu Wolfborn took charge of the Grand Marshal's office and the Settlement of Swords opened the campaign in Hukai. This region was completely monopolized by Bufawuri's remains. Hukai, in South Bomdan, was a region where warlords would rule over large populations concentrated in a few fortress cities. Many fortified locations in Hukai were integrated with their surroundings, often featuring less than ideal terrain to carry out assaults and had little space to dedicate to artillery batteries. Naturally, a solution would be needed for this situation, so natural scientists were incorporated into each army Sunyanin to analyze the geography of each problematic fortress and discover vulnerable areas that could be attacked and quicken the siege operations. The bomb humans of the region were generally very proficient climbers, capable of scaling the forts with unmatched ease. These talents were obviously very valuable. Instead of this potential go to waste, Grand Marshal Zoburu employed cooperative bomb to scale the walls of the Kaptei Teleni and sabotage their defenses, leading to its eventual capture. The city itself was especially well designed, with an engineering competence that far outstripped the status of the warlord inhabiting it. Each side was capable of providing support to at least one other side of the fortification. The defenders were able to offer substantial resistance against the attacking forces, but the utility of the city under hobgoblin control could only be imagined. An opportunity showed itself in the south for a surprise attack. A fairly isolated Pink Hoi was battered and its previous conquests were returned to Araf Kelin, the command's vassal. 1617 saw the beginning of the age of absolutism. Together with it, a number of changes occurred in the command society. The campaign in the debate halls was as successful as any other, and with the origins of so many of the high philosophy school of thought under control, the command convinced the masses that the God-lost ideology was the way of the future. Some schools were so similar to the God-lost ideas that they agreed more than debate. This strengthened the teachings greatly. On a larger societal level, with the increase of the half-orcs in the lands, especially in Ninun enforced areas, they've seen a new identity. Instead of bastards and outcasts, they were being seen as hard-working craftsmen, dedicated to a sense of honor. With this reputation, the half-orcs have gained a much better place among the human Wuhyun society. This harmony was encouraged, and half-orcs proved to also be able to reach half-orc Wuhyun status themselves, and even organize in majority groups in some provinces. With a large network of schools under control, the state began directing their curricula, to benefit its immediate goals. These teachings could be changed at will, only costing administrative power points. But perhaps the biggest sweeping thought that appeared at this time of cultural and educational revolution was the concept of nationalism, the philosophy of state and blood. This split the world in two groups, us and them. Everyone who works as part of the state was us. Members of a united family afforded respect that such membership entailed. Race and history were no barrier of entry. Those who opposed the command was them. Those who rejected the family and would see it stopped if not destroyed. This would unlock a new godless teaching that many future marshals would adopt. On the field of battle, favorable defensive terrain, plentiful supply stores and high-quality engineering made the fortresses of Hukai formidable even to the command's advance in the region. Formidable but not impregnable, and Buvawuri as well as the remains of Lotte Kang were crushed once again, and the fortresses of Kapte Teleni as well as Prukakin were annexed. Next stop, Rakadesh. In this far western area of Rahen, past the ruined kingdoms who now lived up to their names, the humans lived similarly to how the hobgoblins did before their rise to greatness. Pastoral herders, divided by petty feuding over grazing rights. Others lived in lavish fortresses, watching over the rushing rivers which divided the region. The Denbasana in the southwest and the Narajandi in the north. The Gankeden families and the Raj were fierce adversaries, and war in the west lasted for almost a decade. Wars raged, 
Thousands of feet march to the beating of booming drums, rhythmic gunfire and the melodic clangor of steel. Yet the homesteads to which each soldier longed to return were in peril. Grand Marshal Iztue Lionborn in 1626, driven by nationalism, decided that the time came to codify the law under one central authority so that no individual may shirk their responsibilities. The ten reforms would be engraved in stone so that they may stand eternal, just as the hobgoblins stood resolute in the face of an enemy bearing down upon them. The reforms would detail the social, legal and administrative codes that all must follow for the edification of each individual and the permanence of the great command as a whole. The first reform returned a large amount of crown land to the state and the second allowed for more efficient development of lands. In the northwest, Dakilamvi, the root gate, was captured. Regardless of who would control the Tree of Stone, the command would construct a bulwark against the potential horrors that lurk in the caves and from then on keep a close eye on the activities in the region. In the south, Rayav Haspal and its monumental halls of endless debate allowed the Grand Marshal to learn from the stories of discussions between great men whose words were immortalized here and grant the state control over this glimmering monument of wisdom. In the furthest reaches of Rakadesh, some of the herdsmen concealed themselves in the hills and valleys. At worst, they defied the conquerors with ferocity. At best, they persisted in blissful unawareness of the invasion. It had been decreed that in order to solidify control, Senunin would be dispatched to demand oaths of loyalty from the Gankeden patriarchs. Should they refuse, the family lines they held so sacred would be severed. Such were the demands of the Grand Marshal. While the West was firmly secured, in the East, the rich trading republic of Tian Lo exploited the command's interference in the region to expand. To reach the jewel of Yanshen, the historical warlord city of Jiangdu had to be taken first. The warlords were gone, and the Kikun, with Sun Yan in support, marched in almost unopposed. The Dragon Command's best artillery battalions based in the region made quick work of any fortifications that stood in front of the marching troops. Jiangdu was easily taken, and the supply routes towards Tianlo itself were opened up. As fortified as it was, the city could not withstand determined and prolonged artillery fire. Massed batteries caused substantial collateral damage, but it was a cost within acceptable parameters. Tianlo contained an extremely large temple complex, perhaps the largest on the continent, likely the basis for its position as the largest city in Hales. Its strategic value was just as large, as a potential tactical hub and trade depot for all Yanshen. It also opened up a non-mountainous route to Jianxiang, perhaps an opening for a future campaign. In the meantime, the Thunder Fist slave tribe would desecrate the coast of Beikdu Gang with their barbarity. The Golden Highway project was further expanded towards the Rahen coast and two more reforms were passed for cheaper stability increase and extra maximum absolutism. The separate Ninyu Kikun, the elite guard of the wolf, boar and lion commands were strengthened and unified. From a small group of elite troops, they became a combined army that would bring together the strengths of all the tribes into one cohesive force to serve the nation at large. The Ninyu Kikun would sink their teeth into Sikai, the next target for the Great Campaign. The area that constitutes northern Thidinkai, a land that spans approximately from Azkare to the dwarf hold of Verkal Ozovar. The Grand Marshal would lead the armies to pacify Azkare and sweep eastwards to subjugate the dwarves. This was a land where the Elephant Command was in charge, their divisions displaying a noticeable performance compared to other groups. The Elephant Marshal himself joined the campaign with great enthusiasm. Azkare, the predominantly elven realm, attempted a strange system in the past, where they held every subject in equal regard, an unfeasible idea that would eventually be forgotten. Verkal Ozovar was also focusing its resources on protecting its subjects in the surrounding farmlands, as opposed to ensuring its own defenses and adequately preparing for war. 
The hold fell quickly and it was sacked, looted and ruined so thoroughly that even the deepest tunnels could not support resistance. With some of the most fertile lands in the continent captured, the campaign was proclaimed a success, and the way to pacify the rest of Thidinkai was wide open. To settle the debate between court and country, the Grand Marshal declared a reckless war against Afhavub Hiai. This action would spark a small disaster and a dire time of restlessness within the nation, but the leadership was prepared to pull through. For a long time, the Tree of Stone has been of little concern to the Hobgoblins. With the establishment of the Jade March and reports of consolidation and expansion within the Tree, it was time to reassess this perspective. Dwarven recolonization and goblin consolidation proved potential threats to the hold over the Jade Mines, as well as the surface territories bordering the mountain. The Goblin Slave State had shown some initiative already in taming the Tree of Stone, the Jade March explorers and settlers have ventured into the region, mapped the tunnels and began taking root. The Chain Grasper Goblin Clan, no doubt fueled by the necromantic powers of their clan boss Duck Chain Grasper, had control over the roots of the tree, the holds of Grozumdir and Ovdal Kanzad. While the trunk was divided between their capital of Ovdal Az An and Jade March's own Hul Az Krakazol. The initial assault against them was a smashing victory, but the Chain Graspers would hold out within their capital while losing all of the rest of their territories to the Jade March. The final hold had to fall before the campaign could be declared a complete success. The troops had free reign to practice their tactics on the remaining few surviving foes on the borders of the nation. The state slowly passed more and more of the ten reforms, one after the other. Money, government capacity, faster autonomy reduction, quicker envoy travel time. Many lessons for a magnificent state. The final reform was passed in 1637, which opened up the debate for the place of the Grand Marshal in Hobgoblin society. Between absolute authority while in power and a leader that would share power with the war room, consensus was deemed necessary if the command would thrive in the age of absolutism. This bottom-up manner of organization ensured that the factions would remain satisfied and would provide greater strategic cohesion. The nation's borders were reinforced with great elephantine walls, a feat celebrated with the removal of Buvauri from the map. The Shinobi announced a mistake by the Chain Grasper clan. A misguided diplomatic play in Rakadesh made them decide to ally with the tired remains of Denizhan Raj. This was the perfect opportunity to circumvent the official truce and conquer the final hold within the Tree of Stone. While the disparate goblin clans were being assimilated into the march and the remaining dwarves killed or exiled, the mountain region was under a hobgoblin authority and administration passed off to the march goblins who were now more than capable to attend on their own so that the great command could divert its attention to more pressing matters. A cunning diplomatic and military victory was coupled with a victory in the structure of the state. The court and country disaster ended, catapulting maximum absolutism through the roof. This enabled the Grand Marshal to offer all beneficial privileges to the six commands and still have some absolutism to spare. To celebrate, manufactory construction and renovation of the Hall of Endless Debate was commissioned. With the monument upgraded, the ninth government reform was adopted regional representation, for more core creation cost reduction. The armies in the fields were now so numerous that none in Halan could rival them. Military hegemony has been achieved and all the world was now a reed, ready to bend before the mighty war wind. In the middle of the 17th century, the manufacturing institutions spawned in Kira speed, a glorious statement to the world that no industries could rival the commands. To celebrate this shining advancement, the Grand Marshal moved the capital from Sarilav Khan to Denizhan Sar, resettling the war room into the Golden Palace and activating the Grand Monument. Grand Marshal Dizuvon Borbor ascended to leadership in 1652. A relatively weak leader with no diplomatic abilities, he still commanded the greatest army in the world. The Thidin Kai campaign was just another organized conquest. The northern areas were very fertile and the vast tracts of farmlands were seized and used to ease the strain of logistics in the region. 
Rice from these farms was seized and redistributed to the soldiers, making it much easier to keep stock of than rations from elsewhere in the nation. United under one banner, the northern city of Nirakvonkai and the coastal redoubt of Keoaden fell together. Official demonstration has been achieved between this campaign and the quick Lupulan adventure that followed. Hobgoblin were known as equal amongst men, yet it would be a man's privilege to be considered equal to a hobgoblin. A far cry from the plains of Thidin Kai, the Lupulan was a nightmare to traverse. Tense jungles, myriad tribes, each with their own king and own army. Enough hiding places for a thousand rebel groups to conspire in. Fighting in extreme humidity surrounded by dangerous wildlife and strong foliage was not an expertise of the hobgoblin legions. Yet it was not a problem for the orcs, whose thick hides and rugged constitution would allow them to be superior fighters in this environment. Properly trained and set loose, the orcs would prove to be the winning strategy in taming these forests. While the orcs hunted, the command would work on incinerating large swathes of jungle to be able to make large-scale troop movements and transport necessary equipment. Determination and innovation would eventually brush aside all separate customs, laws and ways of the jungle tribes for the one law of the Great Command. Their primitive tribal bonds would become history, but the occupying forces of the region would need to contribute to regrowing the devastated rainforests so that proper productivity following the slash and burn campaign could be restored. The Lupulan was burned, but would be revigorated by the sweat of the brow of the working man of the Great Command. The war room never rests, so the next settlement of swords laid down the plans to finish the northern conquests. On the borderlands of Yanshen, Jianxiang was a region defined by old, decayed kingdoms with locals continuously under assault by the wild Shuvush nomads and peasant rebels fighting against eunuch and Harimari overlords. Yet despite its sorry state, the city of Jianxiang stood as a brightly shining jewel the furthest point in Harimar's empire and the command's next objective. Geographically, the northern parts of Yanshen had an uncanny resemblance to Shamakad. The litter of forts and ruined castles were a familiar and easy task for the siege engineers, so well practiced since the destruction of the ruined kingdoms. The city of Gushibi in particular was a great prize. It was home to the Stone Army, one of the most notorious mercenary bands in Yanshen. The fall of the city allowed the command to forever disband this force so often employed against the hobgoblins by the local warlords. The rest of the peasants and farmers stood no chance against the legions. The Harimari pyromancers on the walls of Jianxiang fought back valiantly, which made for an honorable siege, but also proved to be a potential future problem. The Dragon Command expressed particular interest in controlling the city and requested a permanent posting in this outpost to better pacify the locals and to get rid of any unwilling subjects around this far eastern outpost and to break the claws of the pyromancers once and for all. The dragons were granted their wishes. Radical advancements in manufacturing enabled the development of artificery and they were at the forefront of invention in this age. The Dragon Command had been created to oversee Yanshen and more effectively control the processing of Korashi in the area. Coupled with a wave of innovations, they began experimenting with excess Korashi and have tuned the binding chains to allow for more precise and incremental control over the powerful magics held by the shamans. As a consequence, estate magics could now be allowed to be cast for the benefit of the larger realm, without sacrificing control over the magic wielders. In 1660, the final march south commenced towards the most important city in southern Halles, the port city of Arav Kelin. Originally constructed as a naval station of the Sun Elf invasion of Halles, it later outgrew this purpose and became a powerful city-state on its own. With this port city and the monumental sea fortress of Aksa San Uyego already under control, the campaign was over even before it started and a grand war galleon named the Whale Command was constructed to serve the state on the high seas and project the power of the Hobgoblin fleet across the waves. At this point almost all Halles was under direct control and the following campaigns were planned as more of a traditional formality rather than anything else. 
The eyes of the command were now peering across the edges of the continent. A diplomatic mission within the Middle Serpent Spine achieved the peaceful subjugation of the Golden Dwarves. Verkal Gulan Hold was then demanded from Azkasur, the hegemon of the Golden Highway in Far Salahad, achieving another solid foothold in the Dwarven Mountains. The Dwarves, thankful for the return of their ancestral home, rewarded the Grand Marshal with a citrine gem of the Dwarf Kron. The Gnomish Gomo began requesting permission to open branches in Sarisung and Tian Lo to study and compare notes with the engineers of the Dragon Command. They were granted safety and free passage throughout Hobgoblin lands and they would bring new ideas, inventions and innovation with them from faraway Karnor. The Harimari court of Denizhan Raj now comically held a few desert provinces north of the Denbasana. The final push in the Tiger Command's region was easy. The place where the Arachen Raj began was now going to become its grave and its former capitals bowed down to the marshals. All things in Arachen revolved around the Raja, but that state of affairs was ended permanently. The Grand Marshal rode down the Great Boulevard in the heart of Vajia, mounted atop of massive warg and accompanied by the sound of victorious trumpets. Thousands upon thousands of soldiers snapped to attention in the city of victory when he raised his hands. And they all saluted as one. Rahen finally belonged to them, and it would belong forevermore. The howling of horns announced the end of the 20th campaign of the Great Command. The pirates of Pink Hoi have pestered the southern coast for too long. As soon as the chorus of trumpets started to play songs of victory on the Dembasana, Ping Hoi were declared war upon, while the war room examined the details of the campaign in the region. Pai Hon Shin used to be the uncontested master of the Thi Ding Kai region. These lands were influenced by spirits more than any other so far. Seeming like the work of a rogue mage, the truth was that the supernatural forces were so strong due to a strange entity that called itself the Ghost Emperor. This renegade spirit received the same fate as any renegade shaman. Elimination. Ping Hoi, a dishonorable pirate state, stood no chance against the encirclement from land and sea, so the lands of the Ghost Emperor, together with the rest of the southern coast, were taken with only a token resistance. No pirates would ever again pester hobgoblin waters. The final campaign in Halles targeted the jungles of South Yanshen, known as Ziujut. Despite having no particularly large states, the alchemical expertise of the people who inhabit this region could prove to be a thorn in the command side by harassing supply routes or supplying alchemical equipment to its enemies. The legions advanced slowly along the jellyfish coast, beginning from the port of Zhugok towards the large port city and treasure fleet base of Chu Hyok. On the opposite end, the port of Feiten was renowned for its development of floating balloons that could carry significant amounts of material and men, a uniquely fascinating technology that was within the command's grasp. The capture of Feiten, its armada of whaling trawlers and ships of the air allowed the hobgoblins to scout the lower Yan with an unparalleled efficiency. The Zhujut had a strong spirit, the capture of Shi Yun and of Luo Yip, the home of the House of Fire and Water, would not achieve the full support of the region. The alchemical guild, known as House of Fire and Water, was initially intimidated into submission through a series of brutal executions, but eventually it was completely disbanded and torn down. And so ended the last grand campaign. The few remaining tribes who somehow survived the constant onslaught were all put down in 1670. The command conquered all of Halles, completely. When the master forges a blade, he takes the unrefined ore and consolidates it through hammer blows. Then he divides his metal into strong steel and soft iron. Through folding and heating, he expels any impurities from the bar strengthening the bond. Then to make the blade, he wraps the steel around the iron, with steel forming the edge of the blade and iron forming the spine. This makes a complete hole and results in a sword unlike any other. And so has the command forged itself into a complete hole. It has been hammered, folded, refolded, recombined, heated and quenched. 
Their reforms, their wars and their internal struggles made them stronger. It was time to show the world that they were not just six disparate commands united in an alliance. They were one great command. With the absolute domination Casus Belli, the command could take incredible amounts of land from enemy great powers. This Casus Belli acted like a pumped up imperialism Casus Belli and its effect allowed the seizing of a lot of land at once. Yet the final reward was still out of grasp. The state had to work extremely hard to educate the humans within its borders and turn them into Vuhyun. The state edicts wouldn't have to work for long. The command already began expanding westwards like a conflagration that intimidated the sun itself. In 1428, Hales was a land of chaos and strife. It was a land that was weak and exposed with kings and peasants squabbling amongst themselves. Now all that has changed. We have reshaped the world, forged a single people out of the many feuding tribes and kingdoms. A new language has arisen. Social values are one and the same from Tian Lo to Saramaya. Humanity has prospered under our rule and guidance and we have learned from them in turn. We now march side by side, hobgoblin, human, harimari and half-orc. Our boots beat to the same drums. One people, one command. But now, in 1677, we have come to learn much of the world beyond the mountains and the seas. And just like Halis in 1444, it is a place of chaos and strife. It is time that we sign our fate. Halis isn't enough, and we must unite the world. The war room has gathered in the shadow of Mount Tugayasa. Each command was represented. Marshals of the wolf, boar, lion, dragon, elephant and tiger commands led their generals and the lieutenant generals of the Nosunin, Gikunin and Sunyanin. But not just hobgoblins have joined the great hall in Tugayasa. The generals of the Vuhyun Kikun have recently arrived and taken their place with their men and women among whom were not just humans but also Harimari and Haforks. As one, all gathered plunged their weapons into the ground, as is tradition at the Kenu Ike. The marshals removed their armor, it was carried away according to tradition and the six most powerful hobgoblins in the realm joined their elected superior, Grand Marshal Yuto whose tent had been set up overlooking the mighty Karuniana and the white peak of the Oracle Mountain. In a normal Kenu Ike, this would be the moment of proposal, solicitation and argument. However, there was none of this. They all knew that they have come here for a purpose. They were here to make a concord, to speak as one voice. It was time to pronounce a command, one not just for Hales, but for the world. With the edict in place, the one command took Halan by storm. None could stop the marching boots. Not the Sun Elves, not the Lake Federation, nor the revolution that began in the workshops of Arbaran. The great empire of Anbenar was itself dismantled in 1732. The great rivals of Gaved and Laurent were thrown into oblivion and stepping on their carcasses, the command has taken Elentir, the ancient destroyed continent, as well. In 1769, after almost 100 years of a universal push, the command has conquered the entire world. All would hail the eternal Chimera. And here we are. We are at the end. I think it's obvious by simply looking at how long this video is, what an incredible experience the command is. I think the real strength of its mission tree and the war room system is the incredibly immersive way in which one gets to explore Hales while playing the command. That was the reason that compelled me to go ahead and do this expansive descriptive video. It would be a shame not to do it. The massive amount of work and heart put into this nation is tangible and I'm glad that it ended up being such an amazing success. Even if the hobgoblins feel like an army of Prussian Mongols riding on wolves with teeth made of samurai, the command really doesn't have that many army quality bonuses, aside from the occasional temporary one granted by war room missions. Their strength stems from starting very strong, the strongest nation at the start, 
and from the fact that they outpace everyone else in terms of army professionalism and army tradition. This gap, coupled with their massive snowballing, makes them the force that they are. Their constant trickle of army professionalism, together with their innate manpower bonus, ensures that they never run out of manpower. Besides, they get the equivalent of the imperialism CB from day one, and up to five vassal states from the very beginning. Their style of conquest is also a treat. They are somehow bestial and non-bestial at the same time, and have so many interlocking systems that, while intimidating in scope, work beautifully together, making conquest feel like an art. In the end game, they easily get 60% core creation cost reduction and 60% administrative efficiency, and that makes conquest a breeze. They can also convert all human cultures to their accepted Wu Hyun one, essentially for free and for zero hassle, which destroys separatism and almost removes the fear of separatist rebel spawns. At the start, while I was playing through the campaign, I placed the command squarely in the lawful neutral alignment box. Their beautiful family portrait at the start of the game makes them even feel pleasant. Yet the further I went and the more I conquered, the more I saw them for the evil that they are. Perhaps there was a reason for their discrimination by humans in the first place. Now I am convinced that they are truly lawful evil. A racial supremacist hobgoblin dream where everyone is a weapon for them to wield and the entire world is their victim. The final question is... What is the purpose of a state that only serves the army when there is nothing else to conquer? A happy new year and a warm thanks to all the Patreons and channel members. Thank you for your trust and your support. So thank you Baconomics, thank you Casimir Overell, thank you Loop Forex, thank you Darth Mozart, thank you Maybe Pigeon, thank you Peter Mushinsky, thank you Alex, thank you Jacob Rubin, thank you Michael VR, thank you Old Toby, thank you Shredded Paperplate. Thank you Thorsmane, thank you Chips Lejeune, and thank you Deppert. See you in the next one.